Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we speak with writer, speaker, and worship leader, Crystal Evans Hurst. Crystal grew up as the daughter of Dr. Tony Evans and was surrounded by the Word of God her entire life. Although her upbringing was rich in love and God's teaching, when she ventured out on her own, she experienced missteps, pain, and disappointment. But the truth that God was still a part of her story, no matter the circumstances, kept her ever resilient. She's written about her experiences in a new book called She's Still There, Rescuing the Girl Inside. My name is Crystal Hurst. I am the author of She's Still There, the co-author of Kingdom Woman, Kingdom Woman, and I write to encourage women in their spiritual walk. I am a wife and a mom of five. I am the daughter of Tony and Lois Evans, and uh, my dad is a pastor and has been all of my life. I've been in the same church that he founded for 40 years. There are four of us total siblings, and we grew up in a great Christian home, um, having had the opportunity to be a part of the development of the spiritual legacy that my family has, has, of course, impacted me. And I definitely think that that is forms a great foundation for who I am today and what I'm doing today. But a part of my experience and a part of my story has everything to do with the choices that we each individually get to make about what we take on from our history and our upbringing, what we eschew, uh, and how we learn to embrace the Lord uh, in our own lives uh, as individuals, how we choose to engage with Him in everyday life. Built in me was the desire to succeed, straight-A student. Um, I did not really work hard to be a people pleaser. I just ended up pleasing people because I just usually did what people wanted me to do. I just made the grade and just showed up and did what I needed to do. I went to school aiming to major in marketing. Um, and I took my first psychology class uh, at, that was a part of that degree plan and remembered thinking, this is for the birds. Like, there's all of these philosophies with how people work and how marketing should work. And it and it was overwhelming to me. And I went from marketing, a very subjective study, to accounting, a very objective study. If you live life for any length of time, you realize there are a lot of things that they're not easy answers for. And you spend so much time trying to fit them into a construct. One of the things I have learned to do I wouldn't say well, but I'm certainly a lot better at it than I used to be, is um, what it means to live with loose ends and to be comfortable that everything in life won't be tied and to learn what it really means to have faith. Faith not in something that always fits in a box because God can't fit in a box. People assume, you know, preacher's kid who couldn't wait to get loose and do my own thing and I really wasn't like that at all. I was always a good girl and um, liked being a good girl. Um, but what I always say is that Adam and Eve in the garden had the best parent ever. But he gave them the best gift ever, which is choice. And that's the same gift we all have. And sometimes we make good ones and sometimes we don't. Um, I made choices in college. I was in love. And this was a guy who... Um, had been a family friend. I mean, this is not like some random person I ran into in college. It's somebody I'd probably known since we were, <clears throat> excuse me, 14. And um, we ended up going to the same college and um, things happen. And so I didn't end up pregnant at 19, um, which was one of my, m m one of the first moments uh, where I remember thinking, whose life am I living? This is not even, this is not even mesh in the least with what I anticipated for my life. I didn't grow up around a lot of um, teenage pregnancy. That, that wasn't my friends. I didn't have, you know, a lot of times it's societal or it's cultural or, nope, not my story, not my family situation. Everybody's married. I mean, it just wasn't, but I looked in the mirror and thought, okay, how did I end up here? And there was a huge cognitive dissonance um, in my life because of this reality that was totally uh, juxtaposed against my expectation. When you are alone, when you feel alone, when you feel um, isolated, when you feel ashamed, when you feel guilt, when you feel bad, in that place, that place where it's a little dark and you're a little farther away from everybody else, or at least it feels that way, that is a place where you can get to know God in a completely different way than you can when everything's right side up. 
And so I searched the scripture during that time in a different way. I cried out to him in a different way. I begged him in a different way. And he really was the closest person to me because I felt so far away from everyone else. So because I experienced a deep love from him of me during that time, that is and still continues to be the my deep theological truth that I really want to convey to people in all different circumstances of life caused by themselves or caused by other people or just life. That regardless of where you are, God really, really does. He really, really loves you. It took me a minute to realize how I was getting through it because people would say, you know, you seem to bounce back, you know, from that teenage pregnancy. And then I hated my job in my 20s and you seem to bounce back and find out how to do something you loved. And then I got married and then I had babies and I thought that that's what I wanted. And I did. But when I was changing diapers and making chicken for dinner again, I was like, you know, woof. and then you seem to bounce back and, you know, you seem to still remember what it is that you love to do and then, you know, gained weight and then lost it. Oh, you seem to bounce back. And so what I have realized um, is there's a theme in my life of bouncing back. Uh, my husband has some challenges, some health challenges. Um, he's given me permission to say uh, seven years ago he had a stroke and that set off a string of circumstances in our life. Um, and even from that, people go, it just seems like you're doing so much and you're handling it all well. And so the theme of my life has been bouncing back. And what I realized is there are certain things that have always happened. Um, one of those things is that I keep choosing to believe that God has a plan. My mother used to speak that verse over me when I was a teenager. I remember hearing it, Jeremiah 29, 11, and you know, eh, okay, mom, yep, yep, yep. But that was seared in my conscience, subconscious. And so it kept coming back to me. There's gotta be a plan here somewhere. This is not adding up, there's gotta be a plan. And I kept looking for it. And then when I realized that I kept looking for it the same way, I would keep write down, okay, what am I good at? What has God given me? What has he put in me? My abilities, my strengths, my weaknesses, my skills, my passions, my personality. And I'd say, what do I think he wants me to do now? And I kept searching for the gift of me. Um, the third thing is that I kept looking around me. What are the experiences that I have, the opportunities that I have, whether they were caused by me or just uh, good or bad, what is in front of me? And every time I look for what he says about me that's true, what he's put in me that's a gift, the experiences and opportunities that I have in front of me, there's always a next thing. There's always something to do. As Crystal began to see and live out God's plan unfolding in her life, even during the uncertain times, she began to want to share her experiences and encourage others that they too could find peace in the uncertainty. She talks about how she draws strength from God's Word and from her devotional time with Jesus Calling, and how she developed the foundation for writing her own book, She's Still There. The longer I live and the more I choose to obey God for what I read in His Word, the knower that He gave me naturally and that is heightened by the presence of the Holy Spirit in my soul. I know a lot of people read the devotional and may read the verses there, um, but I take the verses and I open up my Bible and I read that verse in my Bible and many times read verses before and after for a little context and then I um, I write my own Jesus calling. What is he actually saying to me in my situation in life? So I love that it's simple because it gives room for me to do my own work. I started reading it before I actually went back and read the beginning, the introduction, the instructions, where she says, this is what I gained from spending a lot of time <laughs> talking to God. And what I want for you is not just to read this. Yeah, read it but I want you to do this for yourself. And I love that the heart of the author is not just to say, here are my devotionals shared with you, but here's, here's what I did and here's what I want you to do too. I think it scratches a deep ache that we all feel that we want the God of the universe to speak to us. And so many people, including myself at certain times, struggle to know if they can speak with God or is he really going to reach out to me that this is just... You know, it's him and it's him in words, you know, to a degree. I get better and better at knowing. And as I walk in that, peace comes. 
because I know that I'm where God wants me to be. And when I'm not sure, I've learned to experience peace in the waiting and in the uncertainty and in talking to God and telling him where I need him to make up the difference because I don't know. Even in the not sure, I still know that God holds the unknown in his hand and that his plans are not thwarted. Even when we screw up, because we don't, you know, have every decision made cold turkey right on time every time. He, in his providence, can hit a moving target with a crooked stick. (laughs) My dad said when I got pregnant, he said, You know, you're still going to be able to climb the ladder. You're just going to have to climb with a backpack. So in my head, there's always the next rung. And I can't figure out how I get to the top, but I can figure out how I reach for the next rung. And so what I tried to do, um, and she's still there, uh, is, is to write about the practical the practical reach. What does that mean? How do you do it? How do you keep believing and not let go? How do you resist the urge to fall into mediocrity or accepting that your expectations will never come to pass? How do you keep fighting for your life and honoring the life God has given you? And so in a real practical way, I just think there's always a reach. And um, I tried to describe in a very practical way what that looks like. The next thing is I started a blog because I just missed writing and hearing my own voice. When I was in my late 30s and had picked up a bunch of weight, the next thing was, girl, lose it. Go up for a walk. You can do that when your husband's at home and your kids are asleep. You can do something. And so there's always something. And what I found is so many people, because they're reaching for the top of the rung they or the top of the ladder, they forget that there's a next rung, there's a next step. If I can just refocus myself and refocus others on the one thing they can do to move forward, we have a choice when life turns out differently than what we expected. We can dig our heels in the ground and be angry or bitter or derailed, or we can learn to flow with it a little bit. Um, Life is life. (laughs) It's life. (laughs) None of us, none of us are 100% living the life we expected to live. Not one person. And if they say that, then they haven't lived long enough. (laughs) Because life is life. But we can learn. It's kind of what we were saying earlier about living with loose ends. You you learn to live with a loose, uh, with an open hand and to say, I can choose to dig in and grab hold and develop calluses because I have a calloused heart maybe. I can develop bruises because it's physically painful for me to think about what I wanted that I didn't get. We can can (laughs) develop dislocations because holding on to what we wanted so tightly dislocates us from who we're with, where we are, or what we thought we wanted. When you hold on tight, the only thing that's damaged long-term is you. So what you have to do is say, you know what? Here are the things I can control. Here are the things I cannot, or I should say, here are the things I think I can control. And here are the things I know I cannot. And with all of it, lay it before the Lord. It it takes coming to the cross to a whole nother level because it changes what you bring to the cross. See, many of us, we bring certain things that we're willing to lay at his feet. But if you live long enough and choose to open your hand, you bring more with you to the foot of the cross because you've learned to trust that he can handle it better than you. Now, in just a real practical sense, I mean, I literally have to talk to myself. Can I say that? (laughs) I literally have to say, yeah, I I literally have to say out loud sometimes to myself, girl, let it go. Let it go. You know, I have to remind myself of what really matters. Most of the time where expectations mess us up is how we react to them. It's we can have the expectations or feel a loss for not meeting them, but we we react in a way 
And the how is what messes us up. It's how we talk to the people we love. It's how we speak to ourselves when we look in the mirror. It's how we speak about our lives. It's how we choose or don't choose to keep trying. It's, it's how we respond to the shift in expectations that determines what happens next. I mean, Chuck Swindoll said 10% in life if what happens in life is what actually happens to you. The other 90% is your attitude about what happens to you. And while we may not be able to choose what comes to us in life, a lot of it we can, but a lot of it we cannot. We always get to choose how we react to what happens to us in life. I still get messages from people and um, it's been humbling to hear how the book is impacting them. Um, and the main thing that I'm hearing them say is that they're not that they've decided not to give up or to stop living as if they have given up and that I've given them hope of that one thing. And so when I hear people saying, you know what, I've got to call that person and make amends. Oh, I'm overjoyed. When I hear them say that they never thought that they could go back to school, but in the next you know, couple of months, they're going to call and get some applications done or uh, log on and start working on their financial aid. Oh, that makes my heart sing because inspiration will die on the vine, but something that is deeply planted can move and grow slowly bit by bit over time. So that's what I'm hearing. The takeaway is you believe that you are valuable, that your life is a one of a kind, beautifully unique event. And then what is the action step that you will take to honor the life that God has uniquely given to you? To find out more about Crystal Evans Hurst's new book, She's Still There, Rescuing the Girl in You, visit crystalevanshurst.com. We'll be back with more of the Jesus Calling podcast after this brief message from Audible. As a special offering to you, the listeners of the Jesus Calling podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Find your favorite Sarah Young titles, including Jesus Calling and Jesus Always, in an audiobook version, and get it for free by trying audible.com. Check out a small sample of the Jesus Calling audiobook featured at the end of this podcast. To download an entire free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling for your full free audiobook. Now, on to the second half of our show. Our next guest has an incredible story of survival. Diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, Edie Sunby was given three months to live. Fear and worry about her family were her first reactions, but a strong desire to live and move prevailed. While enduring over 79 rounds of chemo, plus radical liver and lung surgeries, she decided to walk 800 miles along the California Mission Trail, and during that time she got closer to God and learned to trust Him for her life. Uh, My name is Edie Littlefield Sunby. And when I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, given less than 1% chance of survival, I had two choices. I could go home and I could prepare to die, or I could get moving. And I decided to embark on a once in a lifetime faith journey and became the first person in history to walk the 1600 mile El Camino Real Mission Trail. I grew up uh, on a cotton farm in Oklahoma. My folks were probably the most uh, authentically real Christians that I have had the pleasure of meeting in my entire life. Uh, they, They walked their faith, they lived their faith, they breathed their faith. They were their faith. And so in times of drought, Uh, when things were not going well, they never seemed to mind. Uh, Daddy would work a little harder and mother would use a little less. And we would always get by and they always put their faith in the Lord because they knew there would be times of plenty and there would be times of struggle because that's just how life is. It was wonderful growing up on a farm. I would get on our old daddy's old plow horse, old Nelly, and all of us would ride around and spook the chickens and spook the cows. And, and I would we'd pretend to be cowboys. So I grew up wild and free in the prairie wind, dreaming of being a ballerina one day and then the next day dreaming of being a cowboy. I was raised with a, a, a whole feeling that anything is possible. 
And in fact, uh, where there's a will, God will provide a way, especially if the will is of honest and, and honorable intent and you're passionate. And so um, at a very early age, I wanted to see the world and I would dream about seeing the world. My mother, a person of enormous faith, was, was, um, was a beacon of light to me. And, and I knew, because she instilled in all of us that whatever we wanted to do, with the grace of God, we could do it. And so when I was 15, I, uh, through the Rotary Club, became an exchange student to, uh, to Australia. And so I spent uh, my sophomore, my junior year in high school in Australia. And, and I didn't have the money for the ticket to get all of there, but the, the community backed us up. And I knew I wanted to go to college. And um, the way to make money for college, I discovered was by selling Bibles door to door, the Southwestern Company out of Nashville, Tennessee. And that probably was the most, uh, that was the, probably the most um, empowering experience of my life. And I learned that you have to be as enthusiastic at the last door at the end of the day as you were at the first, because that last door deserves the same kind of attention and respect as the first person you talk to. I grew up dreaming of big things, and then I went to the University of Oklahoma. I paid my way. I also worked as a janitor. Um, I worked uh, in the philosophy department on, the, uh, on a philosophy journal as a proofreader. I did all of these things to pay for my college education. My senior year in, in college, I had an opportunity to interview with IBM, and uh, they uh, were looking for people like me who uh, were um, uh, enthusiastic, self-motivated uh, people who, who enjoyed sales. And I always enjoyed sales because it's a meritocracy. Sales, it, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter your sex. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter anything about you. As long as you can connect with people and you can understand what people need and what people want, and you can pre present a, a solution to what they need and what they want. I rose up through the sales ranks of IBM, and I had an opportunity to be a vice president of uh, Pacific Telesis in uh, San Francisco, where I had an organization with 500 people reporting to me and my organization. Uh, I was a vice area vice president of marketing. And so all of those wonderful career things uh, were just one step at a time. I met my husband in IBM. His folks were very, very strong Christians, very uh, devout Lutherans who uh, lived their faith just like my folks who were devout Baptists lived their faith. And so we had instantly a lot in common. And uh, yeah, and we, we didn't know each other that long before we got married. But you know, we've now been married 42 years. We are never prepared for illness. We're never prepared for catastrophe. It never happens at a convenient time. And I, like so many people, I was finished with my child raising years in that my children were on their way to college. It was their first year at college. And I was looking forward to getting back into the, the work world in a big way. I was looking forward to having them complete their education, get their first jobs, have their get married, have their children, you know, the, the, the script to the, to the normal life, and if there is such thing as a normal life. And of course, uh, things come at you and, and um, uh, curveballs hit. And the curveball that hit me was stage four cancer. It was in eight different organs and I was given three months to live. And my life virtually uh, turned, turned immediately upside down and backwards. But you know, I, I I was I knew I would do what it would take to be alive because uh, if you want to stand up to cancer, you have to have something to hold on to, and I grabbed a hold of what I could. I knew that I had to keep moving, and. Um, for example, I even, I had to, I fought hard for five and a half years. Uh, it kept coming back because that's what 
cancer does. I was missing 60% of my liver and I missed, I lost 10 inches of my colon, a couple inches of my stomach. Cancer came back again, it came back in my lungs. I lost my right lung. But through all of this, I kept moving. And, and, and I wanted to live so bad that the chemotherapy, I had 79 treatments of chemotherapy, and um, I would even put rocks in my pockets at weigh-in to get higher doses of chemotherapy because chemotherapy was the only, only chance that I had at, at, at surviving cancer. And that's how much I wanted to live. And yes, so I kept walking. I kept doing things, things within my control. The disease was not within my control, but there were certain things I could do. And walking was one of the things I could do. Less than six months after I lost my right lung to cancer, I felt, because I'd fought for five and a half years uh, through all the chemo, through the radical surgeries, through, through, through death really, uh, many times in emergency rooms, many times in intensive care units. When I lost my right lung, and we pretty much got it, we felt, after five and a half years. I was so grateful to be alive. I was so thankful to be alive. And I'd walked all during this five and a half years. And I wanted to, I wanted to just heal. And I had learned that walking is healing. And so I yearned to walk the old California Mission Trail. I needed to heal physically. I needed to heal emotionally. And I needed to heal spiritually. The old Mission Trail in California starts in San Diego and it ends north of San Francisco, 800 miles. And I started this walk of thanksgiving of gratitude to the 21 old missions that lined this old mission trail. And at each of these missions, I would stop. I would light a prayer, a candle. I would say a prayer. The Franciscan missionary or parish priest would, uh, would pray with me a healing prayer. And I walked with family, I walked with friends, I walked alone, but I always walked with God. It took me less than two months. It took me 55 days to walk 800 miles. I walked on average 15 miles a day with one lung. And when I got to the end there in Sonoma, I did not want to stop walking. So when cancer came back again two years later, in 2015, I knew I needed to finish my mission walk. So I went down to Loretto, and with the help of cowboys, 20 vaqueros, Mexican cowboys, and about 30 or 40 mules, pack mules and saddle mules, made my way through the Sierras and the Sonoran Desert of Mexico, following this old mission trail, another 800 miles in two months to the border. 1,600 miles sounds like a long ways. It is a long ways, but it's, it's really from mission to mission. There were 18 of these old Jesuit and Franciscan missions in Mexico, and there's 21 in California. So there were 39 missions, and those, that was my destination, was to get to a mission. It wasn't 1,600 miles. It was 39 missions. And the love that I received at each of these and the, the sense of adventure to get to the next mission, it was the sense of excitement of, of 200 years ago, of walking, of getting to a place with food and water and shelter and prayer and blessings. And, and that's how they opened their arms to me. You know, walking is healing, and as I walked this 1,600 miles, I healed in different ways. My body healed. My body healed from losing my lung. Um, there were mountains to climb, and some days I felt like I would pass out. I couldn't get enough breath into my lung, my remaining lung. But I found that if I just kept on walking, that my lung capacity, my available lung capacity, would expand. It would grow, uh, uh, which is how which is how we heal. And 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 I found that 
toenails would turn black and fall off, but they would heal and blisters would heal and aches and pains would feel heal. And I felt the same way emotionally. You know, God told Job, pour out thy overflowings, those overflowings, emotional overflowings of for me, it was fear. It was terror. It was despair. It was all of those things that, that happen to us in life that when we, when we have no control. And when we pour out those overflowings of emotion, that allows grace to flow in. And as I walked, my prayer became grace in, cancer out. With each breath, it was grace in, and each out breath, cancer out. A thousand steps became a thousand prayers. The prayer I've always had is, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And that's always, always instantly, instantly given me peace. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. To trust in that mercy and to have faith in it, to hold on to it, to hear it, and to hear Jesus calling, and to follow Jesus. What Siri has done with Jesus Calling is opened our hearts to Jesus Calling. And, you know, wherever our heart is, our feet will follow. And so in walking a pilgrimage, the old mission trail, I found that as my heart was following joy, gratitude, thanksgiving, God, it was following Jesus. That's where my heart was and my feet followed. And that's why I did not want to stop walking. Edie's walk to healing was a true testament of faith, courage, and the power of hope. Edie wrote about her journey in her book, The Mission Walker. There was a time to reflect on the story, and that's basically what the book was, was reflection. Not just on the walk, the 1,600-mile walk. It was a reflection on on dealing with that universal experience of confronting mortality. I end the book with the three words, all is well. That if God, I believe, is whispering to us anything, it's all is well. If he could whisper whenever we're going through the struggles, when we're going through the suffering, when we're going through the difficulties of life, all is well. All is well. I'd like to share one of my favorite passages, if I could. Paul reminded us of many things. And, you know, Paul suffered horrendously, horrendously in prison. And uh, in, he, the, 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 the difficulties he encountered were just profound. But he never gave up faith. He never gave up uh he never, he never, he never wavered, and what is written in Second Timothy one seven has stayed with me. And the verse is: For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love. So whatever we fear, be it cancer, be it financial devastation, be it family estrangement, whatever that is, to confront the situation with love and understanding and compassion as God sees us, because suffering is only temporary. Suffering, as Romans says, suffering leads to courage. Courage leads to hope, and hope never, ever disappoints. Hope. Never, ever give up hope. To find out more about Edie Sunby and her book, The Mission Walker, please visit themissionwalker.com. 
Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we visit with Andrea Logan White, who is an actress, speaker, and writer of a new book called Perfectly Unfinished, Finding Beauty in the Midst of Brokenness. Andrea shares about her life and the challenges of being a Christian in Hollywood. You see these A-list actors, you see these beautiful blonde girls with plastic surgery, and on the outside, they're perfect. And so I'm like, oh, this is what this is what Hollywood is. It's perfection, and everybody's beautiful and perfect and running around. They have this perfect life. And I kind of fell into that lifestyle, and I had some a, a good two years of really scary <laughs> events that led me to hit rock bottom with drugs and men and partying that um, thankfully God did not take my life, but I was close to it. I have had a journey of a little bit of craziness, a lot of sin, a lot of brokenness, and a lot of uh, emptiness that led me to finding God. Our featured passage from today comes from the May 26th entry of the Jesus Calling audiobook. In a world of unrelenting changes, I am the one who never changes. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Find in me the stability for which you have yearned. I created a beautifully ordered world, one that reflected my perfection. Now, however, the world is under the bondage of sin and evil. Every person on the planet faces gaping jaws of uncertainty. The only antidote to this poisonous threat is drawing closer to me. In my presence, you can face uncertainty with perfect peace. Hear more great stories about the impact Jesus Calling is having all over the world. Be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling podcast on iTunes. We value your reviews and comments so we can reach even more people with the message of Jesus Calling. And if you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.